kind of talking about my three favorite training devices for, for thinking about risk. Uh, there uh, is a summary of uh, what I'm talking about that I uh, uh, had intended to be uh, pre-circulated instead of my slides. My slides are debusking to them. But on, my, on my blog is a, uh, is a summary that uh, will be a little bit more coherent, I hope, than my, uh, my slides. Um, the, I'm going to start with, uh, with this slide, which you don't have in your hand. Um, and uh, to, uh, this, is, this is what I'm not going to talk about. But it's the context <clears throat> of what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the paper I'm struggling to write for Harry is called something like risk management in the hypermobile world. Um, what do I mean by hypermobile? Well, we have this, this graph showing walk, uh, cycling, buses, trains, cars, and planes, uh, historic growth and projected future growth in, in, in traffic. So I overlay on this graph, firstly an arrow pointing back into history, the peasant pedestrian society, what I call the hypomobile society, not enough of it. Through most of history, that rising graph has been interpreted as progress. Uh, more recently, uh, progress is acquiring a question mark. Uh, for some it already has, for others I think it will. And off the top of the, uh, the page we have what I call the hypermobile society, just too much moving around. <clears throat> and there are a whole host of implications that uh, another paper on my, you'll find on my blog, uh, a number of papers on my blog dealing with hypermobility. But I'm going to, this in effect is the, the mega transport project that subsumes all of others. Uh, the, you know, all, the, all the existing transport projects are in aid of promoting more of this um, or uh, electronic mobility, which isn't on this graph, used to be thought of as, as a potential substitute for physical mobility, but it's increasingly recognized as a complement to it and a stimulus to it. Um, so that's, uh, I, I'm going to be looking at the risk management problems thrown up in that society. Um, Risk is everywhere now. In, in May 2004, uh, before a conference on terrorism, I typed the single word risk into Google, got 40 million hits. For purposes of comparison, I typed in God and sex, God got 60, uh, sex got 80. <clears throat> I did it a, uh, in September 2005, God got 188, uh, sex 221, and risk got 537. Uh, risk got up to 1.2 billion before Google thought that's silly, and it's now back to about 330 million. Uh, so you can't play that game anymore. <clears throat> but there it has been an explosion around the world, not just in, 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 in this country, um, in concerns about risk. Um, and and uh, uh, lots of evidence that collectively we are becoming more risk averse. <clears throat> well, you don't have to read all those hundreds of millions of, of hits to discover uh, a number of uh, unnecessary and frequently acrimonious arguments that stem from the fact that different people are using this same word risk, meaning different things by it, and shouting past each other. So my first framing device is a way of trying to sort out at least some of those unnecessary arguments. Three types of risk. Firstly, risk perceived directly. Climbing a tree, riding a bike, driving a car, crossing the road. We manage these risks using judgment. Some combination of instinct, intuition, and experience usually gets us safely to the other side of the road. My next circle is the one that overwhelmingly <coughs> dominates the risk literature, the scientific circle. Color, you need microscope to see it in scientific training to know what you're looking at. Uh, and in this circle, you find uh, a whole host of other disciplines, everything from astrophysics, charting the impact of, the likely impact of asteroids, uh, through um, medicine, engineering, and at the other end, you'll get uh, actuarial science, statistics, academiology. And all of these have collectively uh, given us a, a useful handle on a whole range of risks. Um, but my third category is, I think, the most interesting one. Um, 
I call it virtual risk. This is, in this circle, you will find the complexity and the uncertainty and the chaos that has already been much alluded to. Uh, in this circle, scientists don't know or cannot agree. BSE is very cheap. The, the BSE is very CJD. Still lots of arguments about global warming, low level radiation, pesticide residues, HRT, mobile phones. Passive smoking to stock market. Uh, there's, um, if you read the, the Daily Mail in this country, there's a new one every week, if not every day. When I first um, drew this slide, uh, the ones in the news, two food scares, Coca Cola and W chocolates, uh, contact lenses have bovine material in them, so they might give the BS in a variant CJD. Sunbathing is the one that is regular, it comes around all the time. Uh, the legal environment is becoming a a virtual risk. We are often very uncertain as to what our uh, legal uh, position might be if we um, if, if something happens and uh, are we liable. Uh, terrorism, new one, uh, relatively new one. Um, Harold McMillan's the biggest challenge in politics: events, dear boy, events or unknown unknowns. Uh, so this is the this is the category. If science can't settle the issue, it's wonderfully liberating. Everyone's free to argue from their pre-established beliefs, convictions, prejudices, superstitions. Um, so you have the longest and most acrimonious arguments running here, um, and they go on and on. Um, the uh, and in this circle, again, if science can't settle the, the issue, then we're thrown back on judgment. Some, again, some combination of instinct, intuition, and experience. There's no clear, simple, uh, testable answer. Now, the, um, the, the New Yorker discovered uh, virtual risk long before I did. This is, this is their version of it. The scientific community is divided. Some say this stuff is dangerous. Some say it isn't. Um, Okay, the, I, I want to, I'll come back to virtual risk, but I, I want to begin with directly perceptible risk. Uh, and my favorite portrait of a successful risk manager, a toddler learning to talk. Um, I like this as, a, uh, as an illustration because that illustrates firstly that for directly perceptible risks, Risk management is a balancing act. In this case, a physical balancing act, but more abstractly, an exercise in which you weigh up the, uh, uh, the, the rewards of getting it right, and he's getting it right, uh, obviously, against the potential pain of getting it wrong. Uh, it's instinctive, wired into us by evolution. We all duck if we see something about to hit us, or we wouldn't be here. Uh, intuitive, you don't undertake a formal probabilistic risk assessment before you try to cross the road or toddle across the room. Um, modified by experience, from very earliest days we start to learn what's hot, what's cold, what's sharp, what isn't. Uh, and finally, modified by culture. This little fellow is performing with an appreciative audience. Other times you'll get up to things that earn a less enthusiastic response. Um, and, and cultures differ. Um, some are more macho and risk-seeking, others are more risk-averse. Um, and so this little fellow will grow up with a set of attitudes um, imbued by his, his, his culture. Well, um, my second framing device then is, is an abstract version of what I think is going on in that last picture. I call it the risk thermostat. <clears throat> this is where the thermostat gets set. We all have some propensity to take risks, some more than others. I've yet to meet anyone who's persuaded me that that's zero. Uh, the propensity leads to behavior, which leads, by definition, to accidents. Taking a risk is doing something that carries with it a probability of an adverse outcome, and it's through surviving accidents, learning from them, seeing them on television, being warned by a mother that we acquire our perception of what is safe or dangerous, and the model postulates that a perception of propensity get out of balance of behavior that re, uh, restores the balance. Why do we take risks? There are rewards, and the magnitude of the reward tends to influence 
propensity. Okay, now this an example um, from the insurance industry. Um, you fit a car with ABS brakes, better brakes. Uh, when they first came out, insurance companies offered discounts for cars with ABS brakes. They don't anymore because the claims experience came in and it turned out that they weren't having fewer accidents, they were having different accidents. Uh, they were having accidents more characteristic of high performance cars, which indeed was what they were. Uh, now, that's an example of what the insurance industry called moral hazard. The, the reduced perception of, of a risk if you were had that stopping distance, you knew you could stop faster, so you modified your behavior. Potential safety benefits, in the absence of any change in propensity, got consumed as performance benefits. You had a higher performance car. Um, okay, now, um, that is a model of how I think what goes on in our heads as we're trying to cross the road. Uh, but institutional risk managers behave rather differently. Uh, they tend to be confined to the bottom loop. Often their job specification says, your job is to get accidents down. Uh, you shouldn't have your judgment about what is safe or dangerous compromised by or corrupted by contemplation of the rewards of risk. That's, that's, that's the marketing department, not the safety manager's department. Um, and so the, the preeminent safety manager, risk manager in Britain is the health and safety executive. Uh, that's their mantra, reducing risks, protecting people. Uh, the mantra of the, um, that's the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents, for those not from this country, the Queen's Against Accidents, uh, and exercising powerful influence for accident prevention. Um, now, the, <coughs> this is heresy. The BMJ, in June 2001, published an editorial announcing that they weren't going to allow the word accident in their columns anymore. They said it's an exculpatory word that encourages negligence. Uh, so we don't want to talk about accidents. Uh, what do we talk about instead? Well, they haven't got rid of the word. They, they, they hadn't paused for very long to wonder why the language of the largest vocabulary in the world didn't have a word for their purpose. Um, so they, they thought long and hard and decided that um, they have to invent a new word, and they came up with incident, injury-producing incident. Now, they, they, they no longer use that because it was just too embarrassing, but <laughs> uh, this is, this is um, there are some, uh, there had been a campaign to rename accident and emergency departments, emergency departments. You're not supposed to talk about accidents. Somebody's always got to be held responsible. Um, more on this, if you want to look on my blog, I've got a piece entitled In Defense of Bad Luck. Uh, the, uh, anyway, I want, to, I want to run on to um, risk perceived through science. Uh, and this is quantitative circle, this is where you get uh, risk, um, this, this is where all the calculations take place. Uh, and there had been some enthusiasm for what some people call a Richter scale for risk, which would involve taking a series of common situations of varying risk to which people can relate. And the Royal Statistical Society wanted a simple measure of risk that people can use as a basis for decision making. And here's an example of what they had in mind. Um, this was the chief medical, middle medical <coughs> officer uh, 10 years ago. <clears throat> and you have um, high, high probabilities, very low probability, one in 10 million being hit by lightning. Um, but usually somewhere in the middle, um, you find road accidents. They are assumed to be the most common risk that we encounter in our everyday lives if we go out the front door. We all know what that must mean. Um, uh, so, how useful is that number one in 8,000? Well, it turns out that um, by the time the chief medical officer used it, it was quite a, it was some way out of date. Uh, the number he should have used was one in 16,000. 
That's just the number of road accident fatalities divided by the population in, in those cases, 1995. Means that dating, I think, is about one in 17 and a half thousand. Now it's come down, come down again. So we've got it wrong by at least a factor of two, but that's that's a trivial, that's a quibble. Um, the if you trawl through the road accident literature, you discover that a young man is hundred times more likely than a middle-aged female to be involved in a serious road accident. Uh, if you're on the road at 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning, the factor is 134 compared to 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. That's an American figure. Uh, the uh, personality disorder, factor 10, two and a half times over the alcohol limit, factor 20. So if all of those were independent, you can multiply them and discover that a disturbed drunken young man on the road at 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning is about two and a half million times more likely than a normal, sober, middle-aged woman driving to church seven hours later. Um, I exaggerate. The four variables are obviously not independent. There are more disturbed drunk and young men on the road at three o'clock on a Sunday morning. Where do I? The four numbers in the equation are all averages. Further variables have to be evoked to account for the variances. Is the car small or big, equipped with ABS brakes, uh, insured? Uh, is the road dry or slippery, dark, well lit, straight or bendy? Is the driver sleepy, alert, angry, calm, etc., etc.? So there are huge numbers of other variables that have to be evoked. Uh, to explain uh, the variance around the, uh, the number, whatever it may happen to be. So, is that any useful guidance to anyone? I think not. Uh, well, possibly to insurance actuaries, but the purpose of the Richter scale for risk at the beginning was to help ordinary people uh, make decisions about risks in their lives. Um, here's another example of, I think, the limited utility of numbers. Here is some sort of treatment that has side effects. I'll tell you what it is at the end that you can try and imagine as we go through. First side effect, rarely a severe allergic reaction may occur with symptoms that may include low blood pressure, difficulty breathing, going blue, loss of consciousness, and very rare, rarely swelling around the eyes, lips, and in the throat. Common side effects, one in 10 to one in 100, redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, bruising around the injection site, oh, injection. Is it an antibiotic? Is it a Botox injection? Uh, uh, so, sweating, fever, malaise, shivering, tiredness, headache, or joint and muscle pain. Uncommon side effects. Generalized skin reaction, including itching and rash. Rare side effects. Uh, one in a thousand, one in ten thousand. Uh, burning, stabbing pain, nerve tingling, sensations, fits, excessive bleeding or bruising. Very rare, less than one in 10,000, inflammation of the brain, spinal cord or nerves, that should be skin lashes, not skin lashes, uh, joint inflammation, kidney problems. <laughs> I, must, I must consult Dr. Freud. <laughs> uh, okay, now, given that advice, would you be, in, would you be inclined to go for the treatment? Well, what was it? Well, that turns out to be the, the leaflet that I was given after I had my flu jab. <laughs> after I had the flu jab, they tell me. Uh, okay. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> back to the risk from the um, I sometimes call it cost-benefit analysis without the pound signs and the dollar signs. Uh, because... The rewards box and the accidents box contain too many incommensurable variables. Money is one of them, but power, love, glory, food, sex, rushes of adrenaline, and converse for accidents. Uh, things that I don't think can plausibly all be reused just to money as the cost benefit analysts frequently try to do. Um, but I've highlighted control and loss of control because 
what kills you matters. It matters hugely whether you perceive the risk as voluntary or involuntary, or whether you see it as being under your control or not. So a voluntary self-controlled um, pure risk might be rock climbing. You do it, for, the risk is the reward. You do it for the adrenaline rush, uh, the challenge. Uh, an applied self-controlled voluntary risk, driving. Whoops. Um, the, uh, unless you're a young man, you don't do it for the adrenaline rush, you do it to get to be. Uh, diminished control, that's me on my bike. No control, but you may voluntarily get on a train or a plane, but then you hand over control to the pilot or the driver. Uh, an imposed, a benign imposed risk, I call it benign, nobody's accusing the mobile phone companies of trying to kill everybody in the neighborhood. Uh, and most people uh, have, have them uh, use mobile phone. Profit motivated, greed. Um, Monsanto is every environmentalist's favorite whipping boy these days. Um, malignly imposed, rape or murder, and finally, terrorism. Now, uh, oh, and I keep forgetting this one. I'm not going to talk about this, so I'll just leave it for the time being. Um, so as you go up that diagram, uh, risks become more acceptable. As you go down to the bottom, you get what we call risk amplification. The, the, um, the bombs on 7th of July last year uh, killed less than one week's worth of, account of one week, less than one week's worth of death on the road. Uh, the July 7 bombs led to 10,000 people gathering in Trafalgar Square the, five, the following Sunday. Uh, three minutes silence nationwide. You don't get 10,000 people in Trafalgar Square every Sunday lamenting last week's road death toll. So what kills you matters. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, the prime, this perplexes the Prime Minister. Uh, voters want it both ways. British voters have such deeply contradictory attitudes to the role of government that they want both to do more to protect them from danger and to let them make their own decisions about dangerous activities. I think the diagram we just looked at helps to <coughs> explain this. I, um, I used to think reading the Daily Mail, which is the, um, has the reputation of being the principal scare members in this country, <coughs> that it was simply inconsistent because it would have lots of scare stories um, uh, and, but it would also poke fun at what they call elephant safety, uh, banning hanging flower baskets and conkers and, and, and all these things. But if you, if you look at their targets, um, the, the, um, uh, the health and safety targets are, tend to be uh, complaining about interventions that, that stop you taking voluntary risks. And the, the, the ones, the, the stairs that they tend to amplify tend to be often quite small, small actuarially speaking risks, but which are seen by their readers as imposed risks. So I think this uh, <clears throat> distinction can clear away uh, some of that muddle. Um, speeding on to the virtual <coughs> category, here's my favorite example. At the uh, time of the BSE inquiry, um, in, I think it was 1998, you'll have the date in a minute. The, uh, the star witness was Stanley Prusner, who got his Nobel Prize for discovering prions. <clears throat> and he told the inquiry that at that time, he, didn't, he hadn't been convinced that the case for connection between BSE infected meat and variant CJD had been made. Uh, he <clears throat> said it was a hypothesis, an hypothesis worth pursuing, but they hadn't nailed it yet. The evidence wasn't conclusive. Uh, he was then asked whether he had changed his diet in any way since learning about BSE, and this is what he replied. I've worked in this field for 25 years, did a go of the lamb chop, lamb brain, sheep brain, the answer was no. But it was not based on scientific criteria, it was based on just emotion. At a scientific level, I cannot give you a scientific basis for choosing or not choosing beef because we do not know the answers. 
Now, the fact that somebody like Cruiser has spent 25 years trying and not quite succeeding in nailing that risk is reason enough for me to put it a long way down on my personal list of things to worry about, but not Cruiser. Uh, we seem to be reacting to the same evidence or lack of it in very different ways. Uh, he, may, if the, he may see the, the, the accident, if the hypothesis is confirmed, in more alarming terms than I do. He certainly spent a lot of years peering down microscopes at fuzzy brains. He may have a more alarming perspective on <laughs> uh, the nature of the accident than I do. Maybe I like steak better than Prusner. Uh, Maybe he's a vegetarian, I don't know. But all this suggests that we need to fit our risk thermostat with perceptual filters. Different information about the rewards and accidents seems to be getting through our filters. Uh, so we have to somehow make allowance for the fact that different people react differently uh, to what appears to be the same objective facts, or, or lack of them. Uh, uh, the, uh, the less conclusive the science, the more influential those filters become. And if the risk is, com if the risk is completely inconclusive, or the evidence is, then these filters can be all determining in terms of what we see. Um, so here's, here's the cartoon version of a typology that I have found very helpful in getting a preliminary, preliminary handle on where different people are coming from in arguments about risk. <clears throat> Start here in the lower right hand corner, um, this glum looking character. You could substitute environmentalist if you uh, would, for most of the dates, it would work out just as well. Uh, uh, the environmentalist treads slightly on the earth and walks the precautionary principle of the return. If you can't prove it's safe, assume it's dangerous. Uh, this character, much more cheerful, optimistic, confident, pragmatic. Um, he's, he's a gambler, he expects to win more than he loses. If you can't prove it's dangerous, assume it's safe. Um, and the poor old fatalist. Uh, he doesn't get seriously involved in, in forward planning very much. Uh, he's overwhelmed by forces beyond his control. Uh, that's your non-unionized uh, Victorian miner, your latter-day refugee, your single mom on welfare. <coughs> Their risk manage management strategy is to duck if they see something about to hit them and carry on buying lottery tickets. And and this one, the top right-hand corner, with the Cherie Blair Rictus, uh, the hierarchist, that's where most of the risk managers are in that quadrant. Um, uh, they are the, the, the makers of the rules, the enforcers of the rules. Um, they are terribly uncomfortable in the presence of virtual risk because they're supposed to be running the show. And all they can say is don't know that uh, rather undermines their authority. Um, now, the, I've, I've, I've tried this, in, well, in terms of, it, you can almost, the, we all have evidence of, of each of these things in us, but sometimes you can see rather pure types. If you think of the transport argument, this guy rides a bicycle, this guy's in a Porsche, this poor peasant's walking, uh, and the number one hierarchist in the world flies in the Air Force One. Um, I tried it. Um, I, I did some uh, uh, seminars for the Navy and then the uh, Ministry of Defense did one for MI6, which is fun because they paid me and used fibers in a plain brown envelope. Uh, they, um, anyway, the, 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 the military said, oh, we, we, we know these people. Uh, military organizations are, um, of their nature, hierarchical. So that's Eisenhower and the general staff. Down here, they said, oh, these are, these are the mavericks of military history, the Montgomery's, the Patton's, the, uh, the Nelson's, the Napoleon's, uh, always in trouble with these people. Uh, but when things turn hot, they're very useful. Uh, down here, they said, oh, these are the, uh, 
not the likely people. I mean, the conscientious objectors and the, um, the freedom fighters and the suicide bombers, the ideologically inspired. Um, and up here is the, um, that's the poor bloody infantry, the conscripts. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I tried this out and they, and they leapt upon it. They, that was, they put their <laughs> uh, take on it for me. I tried it on, on some psychiatrists, and again, they, 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 they left upon it, and, and, and they started prescribing for them. Uh, <laughs> uh, this guy is, is clearly paranoid. Uh, he gets chlorpromazine. Uh, this guy is clearly manic. He gets lithium. The poor sad fatalist gets Prozac. <laughs> and then there was a pause, uh, and I said, well, that's you, you're the governor's bedlam, what do you take? And they looked sideways at each other, and one of them said, alcohol? <laughs> uh, so, now, this, I think, makes a, a, a useful point. Uh, there was discussion earlier of, 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 you know, what is rational and what isn't. Well, the, the, um, this is the cartoon version of the, of the typology. Uh, which is well worth uh, exploring further by Michael Thompson. <clears throat> and he refers to plural rationalities. That, uh, the, these characters coming from different starting points. And they can be entirely rational, entirely logical in terms of the construction of their arguments, but they're arguing from different premises. Um, and uh, and it somehow, sometimes it's used, I was using it a while back. Um, talking about stakeholders. Said, what stakeholders? He said, there are only stake winners and stake losers. <laughs> Don't have any stakeholders. Uh, so the, uh, that's my third, um, my, 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 my third favorite framing device. Just um, three quick examples. First, egalitarian. Uh, Peter Melkett, who was head of Greenpeace and now the House of Lords, um, the, the um, Soil Association, he was asked to give evidence to the House of Lords Select Committee on GM Crops. He was asked, your opposition to the release of GMOs, that is an absolute and definite opposition, not one that is dependent on further scientific research. It is a prominent and definite and complete opposition based on a view that there will only the major uncertainties. It is the nature of the technology, and it is the nature of science, that there will not only that there will not be any absolute proof. No scientist would sit before your lordships and claim that if they knew if they were a scientist at all. So that is a what you might call an extreme version. He, I think he probably needs Prozac, I, I, uh, uh, or Prozac. Um, but. Um, this environmentalist perspective certainly comes into discussion of transport issues. Uh, the earth is sacred to be obeyed and respected and interfered with as little as possible. Um, the, 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 my next example comes, I got a Christmas card this year from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. The um, climate change uh, denier is funded by Exxon. Uh, Two cavemen. Something's just not right. Our air is clean, our water is pure, we all get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. So that's the, that's the individual's take on, on all these issues. In an, in an uncertain world, your best defense is to be as rich and powerful and with as much control over nature as possible. Um, and, and, and finally, the hierarchist. Uh, uh, uncomfortable in the presence of virtual risk, their first instinct, if there's a new alarm, is to rush out in an assurance. We're still in charge, everything's okay. Um, and, and here's, here's uh, um, a hierarch that's trying to be reassuring. That's John Gummer force feeding a hamburger to his daughter at the time of the BSE scare. Uh, and uh, I, I've used this slide for some years now. And just recently, somebody uh, uh, moved on and said, go back to that last slide. And they said, you see that tiny mouth and that big bite, and that big mouth and those little nibbles? Uh, it's, a, it's a setup, they say. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody started focusing, and then somebody said, and he's just eating the bread. There's the hamburger down there. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a nervous hierarchist trying to be reassured. Uh, the... the um, 
<laughs> well, the, I, I try to overlay on this some of the drivers of risk aversion. Uh, and here we have the knee-jerk knee legislators, dog bites, baby, you get the dangerous dogs act. Uh, the enforcers, the regulators, the health and safety executive, the financial services authority, the food standards agency. I was at, used this slide at a conference of independent regulators and I sat next to the, the, the head of the hearing aid council. The hearing aid someone had their own regulatory agency. So uh, th these people tend to be um, quite, they tend to be bottom blue and quite zealous. The compliance managers, they're the people who go around doing things like um, Harry's notice about what to do in case of a fire. I've done a preliminary survey and I'm told that the Dutch don't do that, the, uh, the French don't, the Germans don't, the Japanese don't. Do they do it in Australia? No. Right. So, so we're, 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 we are world leaders in this context. <laughs> uh, the, uh, not, not cricket. <laughs> uh, the, um, and down here, um, you have entrepreneurial lawyers, no big, no fee lawyers, insurers. Uh, and, and, and here you have single issue campaigners. Uh, so if you're the health and safety executive, uh, you will be shot at forevermore by these people who are saying you're not doing enough to protect us. And these people down here, uh, the lawyers, and only no free lawyers accepted, accepted uh, they, they complain that it's about excessive regulation, you're stifling enterprise, and so on. Um, how am I doing for time, Harry? Okay. Um, the uh, I think I'll skip this slide. And uh, my my last um, example is going to be this sort of transport planning. I use this to make the point that risk is interactive. Um, there are lots of things going on in the road, cars, cyclists, pedestrians, skateboarders, uh, and, and they, they uh, have to interact with each other. And this is the traditional highway engineer's uh, solution to the safety problems that they create. It's based on what you might call, it's, it's, certainly it's highly risk averse. They don't want any of their designs or, or constructions to be held responsible if somebody gets hurt. Um, and it really rests on what I call the, the, the obedient automaton theory of human behavior. If you put these things in place, you can force the obedient automatons to uh, go through those uh, channels. Um, so, highly interactive. Um, there's Usually, I call this the lorry driver and the scientist because I cycle and I'm convinced that I can see them better than they can see me. But we interact. Uh, his behavior impinges on my rewards and accidents and mine on his. Uh, there's now an increasingly important third party in all this, and that's the lawyer and the contingency fee or the insurer. Uh, and uh, so he hits me, I survive, or my I don't mind the sentence, uh, get to a lawyer, and his, he tries to uh, make the accident for the lorry driver, not just a physical one, but a, a, um, a large financial one. Uh, but it's much more complicated than that, because we each have one of these thermostats in our heads, and there are now over six billion of them in the world. This is a small window on the six billion. Uh, some of them are large, like President Bush with his finger on the button. Some of them are tiny uh, little boys chasing balls across the road from Shetland in Afghanistan. Um, overhung by natural hazards, which we may be contributing to. Uh, there's the Beijing butterfly fluttering around, creating chaos. Uh, and so in here, we, 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 we have everybody. We have fatalists, individualists, egalitarians, hierarchists. You have uh, pro project managers. You have um, military strategists, you have terrorists, you have the whole lot of us. And with increasing mobility worldwide, these, these connecting links are getting uh, longer and more numerous. Um, and, and so the, uh, 
this, this is the problem that means that so many risks that we are destined to live with are virtual. They're never going to be nailed to the floor uh, with any sort of calculus. Um, after I produced this diagram first, I added this little character uh, when I discovered a survey that said 69% of Americans believe in angels and 46% have their own guardian angel. When I first added it, I, I thought, nice little joke, uh, since the advent of the suicide bomber, it doesn't seem as funny. Uh, so I leave it there for you to think about. But back to the interactive point. Uh, the, the next few slides are from my front window in North London, looking out at this junk. And there's the hierarchist prescribed way crossing the road. That's how uh, lots and lots of people do it. Uh, in two or three minutes, I'll show you all these. Because pedestrians are, are nature's Pythagoreans. They always prefer the hypotenuse to the other two sides of the triangle. Uh, and so there's another one, there's another one, there's another one. Uh, and that's Bounds Green, North London. Uh, that's another way highway engineers help people cross the road. Uh, you can wait days before you see anyone using that. <laughs> the preferred way of crossing is uh, on the surface, and you climb that fence when you get to the other side. Or if you can't climb a fence, you have to come up here to the surface crossing, but nobody uses that. Or if you don't like uh, up and over, you can head down and under. Uh, and here is just a little tip from the Archway Road in North London. They should be using that. This is school letting out time. Instead of using the underpass, there they are crossing the road. There's some others up there too. I didn't see them before. That's stylish. <laughs> I inquired. Um, they, they wouldn't search back more than 10 years, but in 10 years they hadn't had a single reported accident on that bit of road. It's, everybody's highly visual. <laughs> Uh, seven Dials in Covent Garden. Again, this interesting mix of pedestrians and traffic and cycles. Uh, again, very good accident record. Uh, these methods are um, one of the few examples in this country. Um, far more in, in Copenhagen and in the Netherlands, where their uh, concept is now called shared space. It's attracting uh, considerable interest now in London. Uh, the, the, the best example so far is Kensington High Street, which had all these barriers. Uh, and there's some more, you know, capital then where you go halfway across the road and then have to press the button again and go over there. <coughs> they've taken all those out in Kensington High Street. <coughs> um, and they put lots of cycle parking down the middle of the road. Uh, and so you see uh, cyclists wandering through the traffic to get to their bicycles. There's a bit of high side the road. Uh, anyway, the, uh, with what result? Well, uh, the 60% reduction in pedestrian accidents. So, if you if you allow people, motorists, uh, in in certain circumstances, it wouldn't work on the M25, the outer orbit. But in certain circumstances, uh, you you can get people, uh, even motorists and pedestrians. Uh, behaving uh, in a civilized way uh, to each other. So, the one, one last example of that. Uh, this article appeared in New Scientist uh, a year ago, two years ago, gosh. Um, God will protect us, everyone else should look left and right. Uh, the, uh, this study, an Israeli study, uh, compared the road crossing behavior of of um, uh, an orthodox community and a secular community in Israel. Uh, and they concluded that uh, these people uh, violated the, the rules of crossing the road far more than the, uh, than the seculars. So I sent them an email and, and uh, asked them, well, what about road accidents, the accident statistics? Although the denied black residents commit three times more on-road violations with residents of other cities, it is not reflected by the injury statistics. Drivers are aware of this in road habits and denied back pedestrians. So again, uh, uh, 
I think, encouraging evidence for uh, the, the idea that um, if you do it carefully, pedestrians and motorists can, can learn to live with each other in ways that uh, permit a much more civilized urban environment. Uh, so, what do I conclude? Well, uh, we should not behave like the, uh, like the drunk who looks for his car keys under the lamppost because that's where it's like. Uh, and if we, if we do this, uh, or the equivalent in terms of uh, trying to explore this area with tools that are appropriate for that area, we're likely to lead ourselves seriously astray. My very last slide, um, the, I invited an artist friend to get a while ago. Uh, and I've obviously been boring on on my favorite subject um, at much too great length because I got a thank you note. Uh, and, 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 and this was a thank you note. I'm a chicken tanker. That's the risk manager. <laughs> This was her way of summarizing my argument that we're becoming too risk averse. Uh, but the sting in the tail is shortly after I got this thank you note, bird flu hit the headlines. <laughs> <laughs> so I put that in my virtual circle. Thank you. Thank you, John. Always the right. Uh, if you see a frost program, he always concludes when he has favourite speakers. Uh, always a delight for you to be here. And that is truly the case with John. I've uh, never, never ever been bored by his presentations. Um, questions, comments, William? Uh, I, I really enjoyed this presentation. It, it's excellent. Um, you. Um, uh, Discuss the, the meaning of perceptual filters in, in the, you constructed perceptual filters in your risk thermostat. I was hoping that uh, also institutionalized perceptions in your risk thermostat. I think there are. Sorry, say that again, do what? In, in, are there institutionalized perceptions <coughs> in yeah. your risk thermostat? Yeah. I think that, that's extremely important. Uh, it's not just, just the attitude and the, the personal feeling of people that perceive race, but it's also institutionalized in some way yeah. uh, in a society. And I think that's the difference uh, when you keep it, uh, uh, your beautiful picture of Brian Brock and the old, uh, I forgot the old city, um, that uh, there are not extreme differences has to do with this sort of institutionalization of perceptions. Mm -hmm. you, you can behave more safely in bright rock by walking in this way, just walking across the street. It can be safe there. Oh, especially if you're wearing one of those hats and yes. the other signifiers. Well, you need that as well. <laughs> but, but the, uh, yes, the, 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 once risk management becomes institutionalized, uh, it tends to lose its top loop. And so the institutional risk managers are the hierarchists. Their job is to, is to pass the laws, enforce the laws, the regulations. Um, and uh, they are, um, on the whole, risk averse. There's, a, there's another problem that I didn't discuss because uh, there wasn't time, but uh, when I'm talking to uh, financial institutions, they frequently have the, the converse problem of top loop bias. Uh, the, the hedge fund manager who is playing with other people's money, in a good year, uh, his Christmas bonus will be enough to retire on for life. And if he gets it wrong and loses a lot of other people's money, the worst that's likely to happen to him is he, is he needs to go down the street and find another job. Uh, and, and so the, uh, these, these two types of bias uh, uh, can both yes. create uh, yes. 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 
uh, I, I did not mean the, the, the regulators and the hierarchy and that kind of, but what people have in mind, what sort of thinking is structured in society that makes it possible uh, to behave in the same way, uh, even without any uh, regulation. Of, of yeah. Okay, well, an, an, another example I think that yeah. reinforces your point. Um, uh, Germany has a much worse road accident record than Britain. Uh, you tell people that, and, and their first reaction, oh, the auto bombs, no speed limit. Well, that, that isn't the explanation, because the auto bombs, compared to other German roads, are safer than motorways in Britain compared to other roads in Britain. Um, so the, 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 it's the other roads in Germany uh, where the rules are more numerous and more strictly enforced, uh, where the problem is. And so I've been pursuing Germans on this, you know, why should this be? Uh, why it's Teutonic efficiency isn't keeping you safe? And a couple of times they've told me uh, the story about the doubtless apocryphal inscription on the tombstone, which reads, I had the right of way. <laughs> In other words, they're appealing to our German stereotype of a rule-bound culture where people will uh, insist on their right of way at the expense of an accident or assume that everybody else is obeying the rules. So rules don't necessarily keep you safe. If they, if they, um, if, if they reduce your level of vigilance with which you uh, yeah. cross the road. I want to follow that up because I think that's an important point. For them. Um, your uh, diagram on acceptability of risk and risk amplification and that very nice sort of conceptualization of voluntary risk um, in voluntary and so on. I'm sure that's absolutely dead right. But um, what I'm wondering is, is where these Perceptions actually come from who generates them. Who, you know, how how can we tolerate such? Um, we, we assume that um, driving is a voluntary thing, and therefore, when we take the car out on the road, um, we're voluntarily taking uh, that, that level of risk, and therefore, it's uh, super cool to get into a crash. Um, but you know, I, I, I question whether. Um, how voluntary participation in a, in a sort of carnival society actually is when you really don't have much option. Uh, if there's a choice, yes, it is voluntary. But um, uh, maybe there isn't a choice. And maybe the, the acceptability is institutionally generated to some extent. It's, you know, there's sort of um, storylines about um, individuality and individual freedom. Uh, yeah, I think the um, I think the car industry uh, supports the illusion of the, the car advertisements of the, uh, the the four by four and the empty misty headland. And, yes, you know, exactly. You don't actually see very many cars in a car just one yeah, yeah. landscape. And and it's an advertisement for freedom. Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, I think I think the question of institutional generation. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks once again. Thank okay, you very much. I'll attempt to <clears throat> add my comments. First thing that uh, there was a natural sort of, uh, starting point. I think for learning some lessons for us in the project is the relationship between risk and control. Uh, it has to do with strategy stepping, and strategy is also about um, pre thought uh, with an assumption that one can control certain dimensions and uh, avoid risk. And I think that the relationship between one's ability to control, or should I also add the rhetoric about control too, and amplification is an area. Uh, I mean, the extent to which, for example, um, in mega projects, 
um, we can actually um, do a patch-up job on the environmental impacts of the project we've already built. I have a witness to the next incident I'm about to describe. Uh, Philip, you may or may not remember Philip, Phil Wright with this, at the steering group committee of the Strategic Venture Plan to Hong Kong, when I raised the issue about the environmental impacts on the mega projects at the time, pre-1997, I asked for an environmental impact assessment back in the <coughs> those days of these major projects, after which I was told, no, no, these will be done after the event, and we will then react, which then really indicates a presumed, at best, a presumed ability to respond, and at worst, the rhetoric that there will be a response. It's okay, Phil, I won't ask you what the real answer was. <laughs> um, there is no doubt whatsoever that intervention and control are related concepts. And in mega projects, do we allow the markets to determine where the group should be, what is needed, or do we, the public sector, intervene to protect the public sector as interests, whoever they may be? Um, of course, there is a possibility that neither really happens. Um, the projects actually merge almost organically. Uh, not quite by accident, but from a good idea into a bad one, or maybe from a bad idea into a good one. And I think that this is a, a this belief that we are we know the project well enough to know what the risks are it will generate is something which you question. I don't believe, for example, in the case of the CGRL, we knew the kind of project we were creating at the time to actually know whether we could actually project the risks that went with it. <clears throat> uh, yet again, the resilience, the rhetoric, the reality of scientific method comes into play. Um, I think I've mentioned to a number of you in casual discussions about the fact when I was working with Ben Fubio that I was arguing at the time, this is now almost 10 years ago, and he was doing his work, we should be looking at the territorial restructuring that major projects have, and we should look at the environmental impacts that they have, and that the issue of cost overruns and project completions was only part of the story. But it was a very fashionable, and still is amongst certain academics, that you've got to keep your research within manageable hypotheses in order to prove them. Prove them. In other words, let's not study climate change, let's not study mega projects, the all too big, let's keep the research into manageable segments of intellectual rigor that we can publish so we can make our career comfortable and to hold the consequences. I'm not into that business. And to be fair to all our research fund or other, otherwise we wouldn't have got the money. I know had we put this proposal to a transportation funded research institution, we would not have got the funding. I was intrigued by the typologies of risk, and I do think we actually will have to look at this in our projects. Whether we have to come up with a homogeneous category that we all share, or whether we come up with categories that each culture, each project comes up with. But there are different kinds of risk takers, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I'd, I'd go with John's categories at the moment. Um, Richard and I have jokes about who's the fakest and who's the optimist very often. Sometimes we switch roles. But um, I, do, I do believe that there are those mindsets. What is rational is an incredibly important there. I'll, I'll be mentioning this tomorrow, um, and I'm actually quite excited about being raised by independently of the work that we've done. The, the, the whole issue of economic rationalism versus other types of rationalisms, we, here in Britain, I think, for those of you from the continent, uh, 
that have been internationally more sane, particularly for those who are currently resident in the UK. And we believe that the economic rationalism, at least our government does, is the only one, this is what I'm going to believe anyway, the tr true reality is that economic rationalism itself is not rational, if you want to look at the broader context. But we can look at that. Drivers, I think that the institutional perception that I got was a very important point, no doubt about it. Uh, I've always wanted to learn more about hedge man management, and uh, perhaps I should get someone to write a paper on that. Um, so. <coughs> There is actually far too much, um, as I've said to you before, it's, it's always stimulating to hear John talk. I think we, we could go on and on, I won't, I don't think it's going to be useful um, use of our, of our time. But I, I'm sure that you will agree that there are enough stimulants there for us to sort of inject into our research. And so uh, when the, uh, the paper's completed, we can draw from them. So thanks very much, John.